Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Lord's house. You know, last week I was standing there looking at all the wonderful food at the 930, like, man, I really wish I was preaching right now. Really wish. It's wonderful to be back with you as we continue on in Proverbs. If you're just joining us, we're going through an expository study, a topical study on the book of Proverbs. I hope what we've discussed up to this point has been helpful to you. Um, and I'm thankful that we have a time for reflection and for instruction in God's Word. I'm thankful for the opportunity to point your hearts towards the truth and, of course, to be reminded myself of the great blessing that's found in just quieting my own heart after all the busyness and the, the rat race of the week. So our study for this morning is going to bring us to a, a subject that's quite different from what we've covered up to this point in the series. Now, um, we've moved pretty quickly, really, through the first four chapters of Proverbs. Um, and in doing so, we're, we're really we're dialing in on the subject of godly wisdom, and we're trying to look at it very closely and very specifically. There are all kinds of topics to cover in the book of Proverbs and to talk about. There's many areas that God wants where he wants to tune us up and he wants to align us with his way of thinking. But our ability to absorb and apply those types of principles, it really depends entirely on our attitude towards wisdom in general, our heart attitude. Without a yielded heart towards God and steady, vibrant growth in the area of wisdom, no amount of practical instruction or exhortation is really going to matter in your life. It's not going to make the difference that's in, that it's intended to. As it relates to edification, I might as well be speaking to a brick wall rather than a foolish or unsubmitted Christian. And you probably know what I'm talking about because you've probably all at one time or another tried to minister to this type of person. I'm sure you've either watched or hopefully experienced yourself what happens when a person's will in an area is finally broken and they're finally ready to follow the will of God. Suddenly, almost overnight, their entire outlook changes and some spiritual growth that might have been very slow and very painful before suddenly just charges forward and totally transforms the person that you're interacting with. I hope you've experienced that in your own life. So in the discussion on wisdom, that's the type of attitude that we're really pressing for, that really needs to be here and present among us. I have no desire whatsoever to come up here and just deliver a bunch of dry lectures on the importance of godly relationships or the danger of misusing your tongue or alcohol or any of the other topics that Proverbs uh, addresses. My desire for each one, and of course for myself, is that all of us would be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. I can't, in my flesh, I can't convince you of the pros or cons of any position. I can't communicate the full implication of any of the subjects we might discuss here. I can't really drive the truth home to your heart in a real way. But folks, God can. He can. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2.13, we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual and if you're properly oriented towards God, obviously you have to be a believer to be properly oriented towards God, but if you're a submitted believer that's growing in true wisdom, then you won't need me or any teacher to force and convince you. In fact, my responsibility really stops at bringing some things to your attention and making you aware of them. It's the Lord that takes his truth and drives it home to your heart in a meaningful way to bring about the changes that he desires. And so every message that deals with the subject of wisdom is really seeking to address that, your innermost thoughts, your desires, and your heart attitude right now towards God. We've spoken about the kind of mind and the way of thinking that a wise person will cultivate. And we've touched on the way that God changes the affections and even the emotions of his children. Now last Sunday I spoke primarily to the fathers that are present here, Realizing that if God's wisdom is going to have the impact that the Lord intends, it will require us to take a very active role in making sure this wisdom and understanding is passed down to our children and to our grandchildren. Though both parents must be united in the effort, 
I tried to emphasize the fact that the responsibility for the transmission of wisdom is going to fall primarily on you, Dad. All parents must recognize that if they permit their children to be foolish or to continue in foolishness with no restraint, there will be serious and eternally significant consequence. Some of you may remember the sad story of Eli in the Old Testament that really illustrates that perfectly. His sons made many wicked decisions, and the Bible says he restrained them not. Parents, and especially fathers, you are responsible for the level of wisdom or foolishness that's allowed in your home and your children's level of involvement in that. So please take that seriously. Now, having looked at wisdom from a bunch of different angles, we come to an entirely different subject of study this morning. If you remember back in chapter 1, we were introduced to one of the main characters that's found in the book of Proverbs, Lady Wisdom. Remember her? She's described in detail, and we learned a lot from how she presents herself. Now in chapter 5, we are, you know, I can't say introduced, perhaps accosted would be a better word. We're accosted by Lady Wisdom's nemesis, her chief enemy. So let's read verses 1 through 13, to learn about her. Chapter 5. The scripture says, My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh to the door of her house. Lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel." Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed, and say, How have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof, and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. So this text, this text reveals to us for the first time the strange woman of Proverbs, the opposite of Lady Wisdom. A more ungodly and a more dangerous character you are not likely to find described in God's word. Now clearly, as we look through this passage and as we look through others like it in Proverbs, you can come away with all kinds of different really good applications. And later into this series, we're going to dig into some that will hopefully be very helpful and challenging to you. There is much that could be said on the subjects of purity, morality, marital faithfulness, all those types of things coming out of this example. Um, A lot of really good stuff for young men, particularly. That's not the direction we're going to take this morning, however. First, we need to reconsider the broad context of the book of Proverbs and then think about how the character of the strange woman fits into the overall narrative that Solomon is building. And then after that, we can come back and we can touch some of the specific subjects. What are we really being warned about here? Is chapter 5 just an exhortation to stay away from this kind of person in your life? Undoubtedly, that's part of the picture. We need to avoid that type of bad influence at all costs. But there's also much more going on here as well. Recall that Lady Wisdom was introduced to us to bring the concept of wisdom down to earth and to make it practical for us. She helps us to understand the true depth and the real purpose of godly wisdom. In the same way, Solomon uses an example that was familiar to his audience to help us grasp some truth that might otherwise be somewhat elusive. It's just as important for us to recognize the danger of an unsubmitted and foolish life as it is for us to understand the importance of growing in wisdom and what spiritual maturity looks like. When you read Proverbs, you need to see that the strange woman represents not just a bad individual or individuals to be avoided, but a dangerous condition that all of us must watch out for. She is the personification of our fallen flesh and of human rebellion against God. 
She is the representative of every wicked thought, word, or deed that sinful man might produce. As the godly wife is both a reflection and a glory of her husband, the strange woman is the reflection of all our fallen fleshly lusts. She is the embodiment of evil. Like Lady Wisdom, she has certain methods, she has a target audience, and desires that are anything but righteous. She is in constant opposition and war against wisdom and spends all of her time plotting the downfall of your soul. She is the darkness that still lurks inside your old nature, your old man. So don't ignore her and don't underestimate her. You do so to your own detriment. So this morning, I want to give you several characteristics laid out in this text to commit to memory. Five character attributes of the strange woman that shed light on our own hearts and on our growth in wisdom and spiritual maturity. The reality is that the believer that living in a foolish or unsubmitted way is just as obvious to people watching as the one that's growing in wisdom. As just as God seeks to transform the life of his children, so too does the woman described here go after your destruction. And folks, if she can't destroy you, she will try to neutralize your usefulness to God. In verse 1 and 2 of our text, Solomon exhorts his audience once again to pay attention to what he's going to say. He, as representing the heart of God, wants you to listen. As verse 2 says, that you may regard discretion and you may keep knowledge. Then he immediately contrasts the lips of knowledge with the lips of the strange woman. Now before we look at some character attributes, I do want you to know a little bit more about the title, those two words, strange woman. The phrase, of a strange woman, comes from a single little Hebrew word, Z-U-R, or Zur. It's primarily translated into English as the word stranger, 45 times, strange, 18 times, or even estranged. And lexicons tell us the word actually means to turn aside or depart. So the idea conveyed is one that is a stranger to the things of God and to his people because they have turned aside from righteousness and are pursuing falsehood instead. The strange woman, as a picture of your flesh, is fully committed to her evil ways. She's turned aside from the way of godliness. And what does this passage identify for us? What should we expect to see coming out of a life that is influenced and motivated by fleshly things? Even as a believer, what should we expect to see if we refuse to submit to God in an area or walk according to the flesh? Well, foolishness has many attributes. We've even looked at some of them already. But the first that's exposed by this passage is subtlety. Number one, foolishness is subtle. The drift into foolishness or carnality does not often come with much announcement or loud warning. Nor does the strange woman of Proverbs expose her true intent, at least not at first. What does verse 3 tell us about her? It says, For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. In other places, Proverbs describes her speech as both fair and flattering. The flesh and sin will always present itself as something sweet and easily swallowed. That's why the title for this message is actually Hook, Line, and Sinker. Verse 3 tells us the lips of a strange woman drop as honeycomb. Initially, there is a sweetness or an attractive element to what is presented to us. The honeycomb disguises the hook, and the strange woman hopes that you will take the bait. She is at heart a liar. Her mouth is smoother than oil. Your flesh will not demand anything from you that is uncomfortable, inconvenient, or difficult. An unspiritual life is by far the easier option, at least on the surface. What a contrast between foolishness and wisdom. If you remember, in our earlier study, we learned that Lady Wisdom, she's anything but subtle in her manner. She fearlessly proclaims the truth in the streets, in the chief places, and in the gates. She is as bold as she is direct, calling those that are foolish to repentance. You never have to wonder about the motivation of Lady Wisdom because she's always perfectly honest and forthright. What she has to say may be very painful initially, 
but it is the only path of blessing in the long term. The strange woman, on the other hand, is not honest or direct. She hides her true desires until it's too late. And she's also pragmatic. She'll take what she can get. Wisdom demands our all because God demands our all. Foolishness is content if she can win over just one little area of your life because she knows that if she has a stronghold, more progress can always be made later. As believers, we should not expect to be able to easily recognize the influence of our old man without some serious commitment, discernment, and spiritual training. You have to become familiar with your enemy to be able to defeat these types of enticements. Recognize that the foolish life is also the subtle life. That the strange woman will always present herself as sweet and smooth talking and she will flatter you with her words. Now moving quickly so that we can make it through this in time, you'll find next that a key characteristic of an unsubmitted life and a chief export of your flesh is number two, spiritual destruction. Two, foolishness is destructive. We've talked about all the transformation and change that God wants to bring into your lives over the past few weeks. The edification, the strength, and the growth. The Lord wants you to be wise, discerning, and spiritually healthy. Your flesh wants anything but this. The strange woman, as she represents your fallen heart, seeks only your destruction and following that, the destruction of others. Verse 4 and 5 tell us, But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. We're talking not only about a person's behavior, but about their eternal destiny. The ultimate goal of the strange woman is to destroy people, even as she's destroyed herself. If you go through your life without ever once submitting to the Lord in salvation, there is no doubt that your steps and your path will lead you straight to hell. That is the final destination of all that is fleshly and sinful. Those of us that are believers won't be subjected to that judgment, but that does not guarantee that we won't be responsible for a tremendous amount of trouble and destruction in this life if we insist on remaining foolish and immature. Have you ever known a professing Christian that was bitter or sharp towards others. I don't know about you, but some of the meanest, nastiest, and most destructive people I've ever known have also claimed to be Christians. People that maintained a form of godliness while using their words and their actions to cut, wound, and tear others down. We'll get into a proper use of the tongue, really, next week starting. But right now, we need to realize that our hearts and our flesh, they always tend towards this kind of destruction. We are all all naturally destructive people, damaging ourselves, damaging others, and destroying relationships. And you need to understand, if you are a sharp and bitter person, you need to know that this attitude and behavior has absolutely nothing to do with godly wisdom. If you are a gossip Tearing people down to build yourself up, spreading rumors, tail-bearing. You should know that all these things are the product of the flesh. Lady Wisdom is direct. She doesn't beat around the bush with the truth, but she's never coarse or destructive with her words and with her actions. We can say definitively that if a person is gradually becoming harsher and more cutting in their manner, they're drifting into foolishness and carnality. They are not spiritual, no matter what they might claim. Growth and maturity and wisdom will always lead a person to be more gracious, more patient, and gentler in their attitude. It's always such a refreshment and a blessing to interact with this type of person, and it can be tremendously stressful and exhausting to endure someone that's giving in to the influence of the flesh. So let's all be very quick to recognize and avoid destroying what God is doing in our lives and the lives of fellow believers. So foolish life, or a foolish life, is characterized by number one, subtlety, and number two, destruction. Next we see in verse six that foolishness and the flesh, they're very unstable and unreliable things. Number three, foolishness is unsettled. This verse is very interesting to me. It says, lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, Her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. The instability of the strange woman is about more than just being unpredictable. 
It's really about preventing a person from ever finding the right way. Have you ever set out to make a change in your life only to have your commitment quickly fall by the wayside? When we make decisions that are based on emotion and the heat of the moment, there might be a lot of zeal, but often there's very little follow through. The flesh will always hinder the right type of decisions by offering all kinds of distractions and other reasonable sounding options to you. The situation in verse 6 is very much describing a person you just can't seem to pin down. The strange woman is always on the move, and this relates not just physically, but regarding her commitments, her beliefs, her behavior and conduct. She is always ducking and dodging, never settling in any one place for long. Your stability and your predictability as a child of God are directly representative of your growth in spiritual maturity and wisdom. People should know what they're going to get when they come to you, by and large, every single time they interact, and what they get should be good. God never changes, folks. His word never changes. Therefore, anyone that is wise in a godly way is not going to constantly be moving forward and backward, up and down, now believing one thing, now practicing something else. As the Bible says, children are tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Some of us, some of us are more changeable than others by nature of our personality. And I'm certainly not preaching against the need to not get stuck in some type of a rut or a vain tradition. That's not what Proverbs 5, 6 is talking about either. Your flesh is always trying to convince you to take one little step away from the path of life. Just one step. It's only later that one step will be followed by another and then another and then another. The strange woman doesn't want you to sit still long enough to even think about getting back onto the path of life. She doesn't want you pondering or considering your goings or the consequences of them. She moves and she moves and she moves with the purpose of leading you along through life focused on everything except what you should be moving towards. If you are a characteristically emotional or unstable person, you need to recognize there is danger in this type of mindset and you need to take steps to ensure that your natural instability doesn't drag you away from the path. Really what needs to happen is that a person would repent of a changeable nature, recognize it for what it is, and then offer themselves to God so that he can be their solid foundation. That's something I frequently need to be reminded of. Though our personalities may have any number of limitations, though our flesh will oppose the work, God is trying to accomplish the very opposite of verse 6 in your life today. He's working to make you the most reliable, the most predictable, and the most stable Christian that he can. Because a person can't ever truly be useful to God if they are continuously in turmoil. And the strange woman is certainly in turmoil. says her ways are movable, but thou canst not know them. Now I hope you can recognize that everything we've covered up to this point it's basically the opposite of what we've looked at for the last few weeks. The strange woman of Proverbs, as representative of your flesh, is the enemy of God, and she's in total war against any development of wisdom in your life. The long-term results of a life that's devoted to foolishness is seen in the next few verses, so let's read them one more time. It says, Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. So we can see immediate effects and also long-term effects. And here we learn that number four, foolishness, is a very wasteful thing. The flesh, the strange woman, is only too happy to waste all of your time, all of your energy, and all of your opportunities. Consider this. Every responsibility that God gives to you has long-term impact and eternal significance. Every one. There is nothing that he has told you to do that doesn't have eternal significance. As we've mentioned, wisdom, it's not really about us at all, is it? It's about those that we can minister to. Part of the blessing of the Lord's work is found in the fact that though we may not see all of the results of our efforts immediately, we can assure or be assured that none of them are wasted. In contrast, the works of the flesh, because they are entirely self-focused, are nothing more than a giant worthless waste. Someday, everything that you did for yourself, every pleasure, 
and every comfort will burn up and be destroyed. Every distraction, every foolish diversion will no longer exist. The things that you do for yourself here, they don't bless God. They don't bless other people in the end. In the end, they won't even bless you. You can see the wasted effort in verses 9 and 10. You have the giving away of yourself to people and to causes that are not godly ones. It says, lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years unto the cruel. Honor and time can both be frittered away and wasted. All of your temporal efforts, as we just learned in Ecclesiastes, will eventually pass to somebody else. Strangers, it says, will be filled with your wealth, and your labors will only serve to strengthen the house of another. The strange woman is dangerous for many reasons. She's subtle, she's destructive, she's unstable, but what she wants, what she wants more than anything else, is for your life to mean nothing in the end. If she can't have your soul, then she'll be more than content with your time, your energy, and your focus. A Christian operating according to the flesh is really no different in appearance from an unbeliever. They will produce the same things, and ultimately their lives can mean just as little. A fact made all the more tragic by the fact that Christ died to save you from this very thing. Salvation gives us the chance to first have our sins washed away, and then to be empowered and instructed on how to live a life that has real eternal significance. The environment we live in is hostile. I get it. The people around us don't share the same priorities or beliefs. I understand. There are many things to guard against, it's true. But the real danger, the real danger still lives inside of us. The flesh will take the very salvation of God and try to get us to use it as an occasion to sin. God forbid that any believer is found wasting the life that they've been given. We were bought with a price. We don't belong to ourselves. And your highest priority in this life should not be to serve yourself, but to bring God glory as you sacrifice what you want on the altar of his will. Don't give your honor to others that will squander it. Don't give years of your life to the same things that captivate the hearts of the cruel. Don't let your legacy in this life be the fact that you did well on a physical level and you left a large inheritance to others. Your true inheritance is not even on this earth. Your flesh will always be trying to find a way to trick you into wasting time, devoting time to your own comfort and your own pleasure. That's what the people of this world spend 100% of their time pursuing. The Bible speaks of enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. The worst thing that we could do as Christians is to allow our flesh to lead us away from the path of life and to cause us to waste our life. I gave you some very strong reasons in past weeks to be busy devoting your life to others in your church and in the work of evangelism and discipleship. Your growth in wisdom reflects a willingness to set aside things that would be a spiritual waste for the sake of what's eternally meaningful. If we're faithful to make some hard choices despite our natural inclination, we'll be delivered from the final point that I want to bring to your attention for today. Look at uh, verses 11 through 13. It says, And thou mourn at the last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed, and say, How have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof, and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to them that instructed me? What's the, the outgrowth of a life that's wasted? What is the truth about the strange woman, even though she presents herself differently? Number five, foolishness is regretful. The flesh only brings shame and regret in the end. That's clear in this text. The foolish son, the one that allows himself to be tempted by this evil woman, by his flesh, is filled with mourning. When the flesh and the body are destroyed, the only thing left is the realization that despite being offered every chance and every resource, you amounted to nothing. If you waste the opportunities in the life that God has given you, you should be filled with regret. This is a serious sin with long-term impacts. Fathers and mothers, think of the consequence to your children if you refuse to receive instruction or listen to your teachers. Think of the failure in discipleship that will take place if you harden your heart against the truth. Regret is not just limited to those that stand before the Lord as sinners. Christians may experience this regret and this shame as well. The image of these final verses is of one that finally wakes up to the reality of their decisions. 
to the full weight of what they've done with their life. You have here a regret over godly instruction and the ones that provided it. Are we thankful for biblical instruction? Are we thankful for our teachers and mentors and disciplers? Do we take full advantage of all the opportunities that we have to learn and grow? Don't let your heart be one of regret because you've given in to the flesh. Let it never be said of us that we despised sound instruction or did not appreciate those that provided it. God's intent is not that you would have regret over your life. It's that you would have a life of victory. And the way this is done is by walking according to the Spirit, recognizing the strange woman when she tries to influence you and denying her any access to your life. Now, as we wrap this up for today, I want you to think about which model your life currently lines up with or is moving toward. We've looked at Lady Wisdom and at many of the characteristics and the manner of godly wisdom already. Before we cover any other practical topics, we have to ask ourselves, do I fit the image of one that's advancing in wisdom or the one that's slipping away from the path of life? Foolishness is so subtle. We must have our spiritual senses carefully tuned to detect it. The flesh is destructive, both eternally and in the immediate. Is your life, are your thoughts characterized by bitterness or sharpness? Or are you growing in grace? The flesh is unsettled and it's unreliable. Are your ways as changeable as this strange woman? Or are you grounded and predictable? Do you have a faithful testimony of this before others? And finally, foolishness results in both terrible waste and tremendous regret. (coughs) It takes the greatest blessings that God could give us and disregards them. It has great confidence at the beginning, but it's left with only emptiness in the end. So are we wasting the life that God has given? Are you wasting opportunities the Lord has gifted you with? Don't live like that. Don't live a life of waste and regret. Don't even darken the door of the strange woman. And remember, remember what she represents. As Solomon says, Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, And depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the different examples we have in the book of Proverbs, both positive and unfortunately in some cases negative, as we see the the full impact of our old nature and our old flesh and the, the results of giving in to it. Lord, if there's any person here today that's struggling with some of the things we've talked about, and I don't, I don't exclude myself from that, um, pray that you'd convict the heart, um, help us to grow, to be wise rather than motivated by the flesh, uh, to be loving rather than selfish. Thank you for the fact that you've empowered that and enabled that in each, each one of your children's lives, and that that can be a true reality for all of us. Do ask that for the remainder of our time today that you'd help us to be clear-headed and, and focused on what we'll consider. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. In Jesus' name, amen.